Hi, Misha here, and let's return to some ships, specifically some Mon Calamari, Mon Cal cruisers from uh, Star Wars. We first see these in Return of the Jedi, and of course they've appeared on and off since. Unfortunately, in the diecast world, there have not been a ton of different ones made. I, I would really wish when Rogue One had come out, they had made the MC-75. Heck, I wish when uh, The Last Jedi came out, they had made the MC-85, the Rattus. They didn't. But I do have two examples from the old De Agostini series. This is the Liberty type. This is the Home 1 type, sometimes called MC-80 and MC-80A. Here we have the Home 1 type from the Hot Wheels, which is probably the most common, but also probably the worst. And here we have the Liberty type from the old Titanium series, which is probably the rarest of these four. So you know how I do around here. We're going to talk about tech specs, some history, and uh, do a little bit of model examination too. Haven't had a reason to use this spinny thing in a while. So we have the De Agostini Liberty type on it. These are really nice little models for what they cost. They're almost entirely die cast metal. They come with a case with even a little background. And uh, they often could come with a magazine or other supporting stuff, too. So this was considered the standard Star Cruiser, fuzz, on the uh, Rebel side. And the MC-80 here, this kind of winged design, was the most common of those. But they didn't have that many. And they wouldn't even really acquire them until at least three BBY, maybe two BBY, and they were only starting to come into service when the whole Death Star thing happened. The slightly different MC-75 was in use before. This would come into use afterwards. So what do we have here? What is this vessel? Well, these were a little bit of individually made. They were... Uh, Star liners, exploration vessels of the Mon Cal people and aquatic people, fish people. You've seen Akbar. And originally they were made as far back as the Clone Wars, and they were made as civilian vessels. But they were always built with the idea they might need to be converted into warships one day, which is uh, something that real world navies have done. For example, the Japanese Navy. It's also worth pointing out that these were designed to go not only into atmosphere, but also underwater, so they were built from the get-go with very strong hulls and redundant shielding. Hence the kind of very rounded appearance. But these were handcrafted, no two were exactly alike. Overall length could vary from 1,200 to 1,500 meters, although it tended to kind of scale towards the shorter end of that. Again, the crew could vary, and these would be changed, of course, when they were refit to be military vehicles, which happened around the time of the Battle of Yavin, a little before, a little after, depending on the ship itself. Once it did go through the refit, it uh, had a crew of about 5,400, a little under 700 officers, and so a little over 4,700 crew and men, plus it could carry about 1,200 troops. Like I said, it had very strong hull and shielding, redundant. It had a total of nine different engines in the back of different sizes and types. And it was capable of reaching not quite a thousand kph in atmosphere and had a class one hyperdrive, which is fast and a Class 9 backup, which is not too slow for being a backup. It had a lot of weapons in place on these wings to give a better firing arc. It had up to 48 heavy dual turbo laser installations. It had 20 heavy ion 
beam projectors or ion turrets. It also had some ordnance launchers and it had six heavy tractor beam emitters. It also had quite a large shuttle bay. Now there are variants of this. Some would have the shuttle bay on the uh, ventral side and some would have it on the port side here, just depending on what it was. And it was very flexible. It would usually carry a couple of support vehicles, shuttles, some light freighters, some ground vehicles, but unlike say an Imperial Star Destroyer, it wasn't carrying walkers and all that. So it made room for more fighters. It could carry up to 72 Rebel fighters, although usually it only carried 36 under normal situations just because that's what they had. Typically, these would be three squadrons, one of X-Wings, one of Y-Wings, and uh, one of A-Wings, although U-Wings would sometimes operate from these as well. It had a very protected command bridge and other vital systems. It was just built to be tough and redundant. So even though it didn't have the firepower of a Star Destroyer, it had better durability and required a smaller crew. A Star Destroyer obviously has a crew of over 30,000. This has a crew of under 5,500. So that's beneficial. But they, they didn't have that many. Uh, in the beginning, at least 37 were sent for conversion, although some were destroyed before this could happen. Of course, let more be converted later. So let's say the Rebels had, you know, a few dozen of, uh, of these. Well, let's take a look at the Titanium. Here's this guy here. Of course, it's more, meant to be more of a miniature or a toy than a true model of the Dagestini, but it's still nice. It's still all metal, and it it looks a little different in the wings, but that's okay because even on screen we see kind of two distinctive models or variants of this. And each one was individually made, so it's okay. They vary up a little bit. Doo -doo -doo. Yeah, it's quite heavy and very flat. No action features. So after the, uh, well, a after the Battle of Scarif, after. Uh, Admiral Radis was lost with his cruiser. Akbar would come into play, he being a uh, veteran of the Clone Wars. And he would use one of these MC-80 types. The uh, Aurora is his flagship command ship for a fleet. And it was the only Bon Cal cruiser in that fleet. He had some frigates and other things to help. But the Liberty, which is what this one was labeled as, was probably the most famous example of this type. We see it in games like X-Wing. We also saw it in Return of the Jedi. They had several in service a year or two after the uh, Battle of Yavin and the Rebellion was doing pretty well, but then the Battle of Hoth happened in 3 ABY and the Rebel fleet was scattered. Many key people and assets were lost. Nevertheless, in 4 ABY, Home One was now the command ship, which we'll look at in a minute, and a fleet was assembled for the battle at Endor. In that fleet, there were at least five of these winged MC-80 types, including the Liberty herself, and the Liberty herself was destroyed by the Death Star. At least three ships did survive and would go on to serve the New Republic, and in canon, they would be at the Battle of Jakku, or at least one was downed. Or if you want to go by Legends, they would continue to serve for years in the New Republic as well. So either way, they kept on. They were very customizable and durable. They just didn't always have the... They were more geared towards defense and storage cargo carrying capacity because of that giant hangar bay. Yeah. And just so you can compare... Here they are side by side. Very similar scale, several inches long. They were a good collectible size because when either of these came out, they were pretty inexpensive. The Titanium was 10 bucks and the uh, D'Agostini was around 20. Of course today, that might have changed, probably has. But I think both are good. Both kind of have pros and cons. The D'Agostini obviously has more um, 
it's just a you know a little larger but this one has a lot more kind of greeblies and stuff sticking out. it's more exaggerated but it's also kind of neat especially for me being able to feel it so tactically this is a more interesting one but um yeah this was the standard ship and it's kind of neat that they were converted and some of the controls inside and stuff were only for the mon cal i mean that was their ship other controls were adapted for standard humans and other aliens to use so yeah this was the common type what about the less common type the mc80a also known as the home one type this was of course akbar's flagship his command ship for the battle of endor and it was less common than the liberty type the winged type but generally more powerful it was about the same overall length maybe 12 to 1500 meters the same maybe skewing a little bit more but it has more bulk because of the way it's created whereas the liberty had nine engines this has 10 but only four main ones with six kind of auxiliary and for planetary flight same specs a little under a thousand kph in atmosphere it can go underwater class one with a class nine backup uh crew is a little bit more about 5500 and uh the guns are a little different whereas the liberty had 40 heavy turbo lasers and 20 ion this actually has 36 heavy turbo laser installations and 36 ion it too has six tractor beam emitters and all that good stuff now this too this type usually carried 36 fighters three squadrons but it actually had a much larger bay which meant these were often used for more ground assaults. They, they were more capable of carrying larger troop transports, ground assault vehicles, larger shuttles, larger freighters. Or they could carry up to 10 squadrons, 120 fighters. And this could carry the, uh, the B-Wing. I'm sure the Liberty could too, but you don't usually see that. Typically the B-Wings would operate out of the, this pickle-looking ship. It's also said to have slightly better armor and shielding. Because these, um, before they were kind of standardized and turned into military vessels, some were deep spacecraft like the Liberty. Others were actually, uh, <laughs> how to say, civic buildings under the water on Mon Cala. Government buildings designed to move around, which kind of explains why it looks like a submarine. Now, of course, in the real world, the reason they did this for Return of the Jedi was to make the Mon Cal ships more distinctive compared with the sharp angular imperial ships. This is meant to be more organic and natural. Also very non-standardized. At least eight of these serve the rebellion, maybe more. Another famous member was the Independence, which along with the Aurora and Home One also served as a flagship at various times and was uh, was there for the Battle of Endor as well. And these ships could stay in deep space for at least two years and they could carry about the same number of troops, 1,200, maybe a few more. But yeah, this is the one from D'Agostini and it is definitely the superior little model, but nevertheless, let's look at the little Hot Wheels. For whatever reason, manufacturers tend to do the Mon Cal Cruiser dirty. Everyone does a Star Destroyer, but very few of these have been made, and most of the ones you find for Hot Wheels are in the two-pack with the Star Destroyer. It's okay. Um, it does have a lot of greebly. It's actually a little bit larger, and it has a slightly different configuration, but again, since these were kind of somewhat non-standard anyway, that works. It's just a shame that more don't do. You can uh, see the hangar bay on the side. Unlike the uh, other one, it's a starboard mounted bay. Or the other one's a port or ventral. But, uh, yeah, it's a larger bay. 
And these could really hang in a fight and go almost toe-to-toe -to -toe with an Imperial Star Destroyer. Again, they still don't have quite as many guns, but one nice thing about their laser systems, they had better, more precise targeting computers. They could use the same batteries for planetary bombardment, ship-to-ship -ship combat, or even point defense against small craft or even attempted missiles, although that might be kind of pushing your luck. So a little more versatile because the rebels kind of had to make do. So yeah, we see both types in indoor, and we definitely know that these would continue to serve after, not being replaced until at least 10 years after the Battle of Yavin. I like this design, but I like the winged one better. What do you think? And as before, here we are side to side. Pretty neat. Happy to have at least a few Mon Cal cruisers. These were considered not only heavy star cruisers like the Liberties, but they were classed as command cruisers. And so they were used to kind of shore up the lines at Endor. For example, the Independence was used as a communications and coordination cruiser, Home One, like I said, flagship. And a third MC-80A kind of held the rear, protected the rear flank. So they were typically used as the center point of a grouping. At least one was lost to the Death Star there, but several, including Home One, did survive the battle. The Independence, too, was featured in the video game X-Wing. But I do like the Mon Cows. I just wish more companies made them. I don't really care for this flight stand, but... One thing I will say, at least it stays on well. They peg in good. So, uh, which do you like better? And that's, that's what I've got to show you. Yeah, these are only two styles that we've seen. Again, there was the MC-75, MC-85. And then in Legends, we had the MC-80B and even MC-90. But they didn't produce these. Oh, well. Even in the Star Destroyer line, they don't always do all of them. You know, I've said for years that uh, I don't know why they don't do the Acclimator. But I'm happy to get what I get, and I do like these. This is definitely my favorite of the four. I just I like the winged look, and it's a high quality. This is definitely superior to the Hot Wheels. But the Titanium is kind of nice. It's kind of a middle ground between the two. A lot of fun. And I like that they have big bays, pretty flexible. And since Rebel fighters had hyperdrives, unlike a Star Destroyer, which had to kind of you know warp in, okay, hyperdrive in to support, these could sit back safely and launch patrols out for light years. So a totally different tactic. And that might explain why they have fewer guns and more defense. But of course, if this were to be blown up, a Mon Cal cruiser, at least it's pilots out weren't screwed whereas a TIE pilot unless there's a uh, Imperial base nearby or a rebel if it gets desperate we're kind of up shit creek but um, yeah I wanted to get back to some ship videos I've been kind of wanting to do this for a while so here we go let me know what you think in the comments and as always if you could please like share and subscribe this is Misha catch you very soon next time